So I'll have him record the recitation this time, so we'll post it online later. Um, okay, so buckling stuff. Uh, we had shown before a couple specific cases. So uh, if I have, let's talk about buckling theory. So we talked about a couple specific cases where you have beams with fixed ends or pinned ends or um, and, and kind of the, the end equation for that. Then we had gone through a couple simple examples, one of a rigid rod with a, a spring attached that snaps back and forth, and then one of just the pin pin beam where we did a moment a force moment balance in the cross section and found that there was some critical load where an instability happened and you get some sinusoidal deformation out. So those were kind of more specific derivations. There's also a very general way to do it. So um, today I'm going to talk about the more general derivation theory case and how we get some of those different effective end conditions. So um, we're going to set up our problem like this, where I have some beam now with an unknown boundary condition here at the top and bottom. I don't know exactly what the boundary condition is. Uh, there can also be some kind of arbitrary applied load Q on the side of this. Um, Q of X, where this is my X direction and this is my Y direction. And this is going to, at some point, we want to figure out if we have a slender rod. Remember, we've gone through the transition between uh, yielding and buckling. If we have a slender rod, when is buckling going to happen? If I then also have some P applied load to the ends of this. So um, if you go through and, and cut the rod apart, do shear moment balance internally, uh, and you end up with an ODE um, that half of it you'll probably recognize. So uh, the really general form, um, let's define uh, a deflection out uh, V of X. The, the very general form DX squared is DI D squared V DX squared plus uh, D DX squared PV uh, is equal to Q of X. So this term in here, are, are, are these two terms, EI D squared V plus PV, this is our, our moment term and this is our axial force term. Um, in order to get a fully general case with uh, an arbitrary applied load on the side Q, you take a couple, second der or a couple derivatives and you end up with something that looks like this. For the most part, like 90% of the time, 99% of the time, you, there's no extra applied load to a beam. So uh, generally, uh, generally, if I can spell right, generally, uh, Q of X is zero, so we're going to ignore that. And um, E, I, and P, or yeah, E, I, and P, E, I, and P are all constants. So here, even though they're technically outside of our derivative, so moment force or bending moment axial force, uh, we can write this in a simpler form, and we get uh, e i v. I'm going to go dashes now. Uh, plus p v is equal to zero. So this term alone, you may recognize from our beam bending analysis. So this is from bending, uh, and this term is basically now an axial force. So um, basically, remember, buckling now is a bifurcation. It's an instability snapping between some bent state and an axially compressed state. So this general ODE solution is basically saying that you have some energy contribution from bending, some contribution from your axial force, and we need to find a solution where this is going to be unstable, where this equation is unstable. So um, the general solution to this sort, this form uh, of an ODE is 
uh, again, going back to our ODE stuff, uh, C1 sine of dx, where here d, I'm going to define for convenience, is p over the square root of ei plus c2 cosine of dx plus c3x plus c4. So this is now a general solution to beam buckling deflection. Right? Um, so these two terms are c1 and c2. Uh, we saw last or two days ago on Wednesday when we did the the pin pinned example, and we saw applying certain boundary conditions. This c2 went to zero, and we had to find when our sine of dx or d sine of dl at the endpoint was equal to zero. Um, and so we got the the dl was equal to zero, and then uh, that led to some sinusoidal pi instabilities. You can do now the same general sort of thing. So the the end solution to this is going to be now dependent on your boundary conditions. So we have for um, for pinned pinned case. Uh, I think I drew this wrong. Technically, that should be on the side. Uh, fixed fixed. Uh, pinned fixed. These are some common boundary conditions you may run into uh, where this is pin, pin, fix, fix, uh, pin, fix. There's also um, free, fixed, uh, uh, and each of those we showed uh, I'm just gonna this over. each of these we showed had some effective length factor so if you remember our p critical the, the load at which buckling will start uh, pi squared ei over k l squared where this k is an effective length factor each of these are pin pin case that k was one because that was the first general case that people had tried to solve or that Euler had tried to solve Fixed fixed ends up at uh, 0 0.5. Pinned fixed ends up at 0 0.699. Uh, and then free fixed is k equals 2. So if you remember conceptually, when, for example, we have a fixed free beam that has buckled, this is effectively, even though its initial length is L, it's kind of forming the same shape as, as our pinned pinned condition. And so we can say it's, its effective length is 2L. That's kind of the idea behind this. But the actual, the actual math that goes into this is taking this ODE, this solution to our ODE, and plugging in boundary conditions. So for, for a pinned pinned case, we know the deflection V here at the endpoints, v of 0 and v of l are equal to 0. We know the moments at the end because it's pinned. There can be no moment because it, it's free to rotate. So uh, our moment at 0 and our moment at l are equal to 0. Uh, for a fixed fixed for example, you have, again, your V uh, at 0 and L can't move. They can't go back and forth. But now your angle, your deflection at that center point is 0. So the, the angle at 0 and the angle at L is equal to 0. Um, for a pinned fix, then you have some mixed condition. In fix, you have V is still zero at the ends uh, and then you have v at zero or v prime at zero is zero m at l is equal to zero so generally when you're going about solving these um, you can then take this second derivative or this this solution 
uh, C1 sine, C2 cosine, say our V prime of X is C1 D cosine of DX plus, nope, minus, minus C2 D sine of DX plus C3, V double prime of X, which remember is our moment over EI, is then negative C1 D squared sine of DX minus C2 D squared cosine of DX. Um, here we go. Uh, and so solving this thing, basically you have four boundary conditions that you have to plug in. You'll end up with four systems of equations that you then have to solve, solving for C1, 2, 3, and 4. When you solve those out, um, so I have it uh, in the notes that I posted online. I don't want to take too long because uh, I know Serwin has to give recitations soon. But um, so, for example, for the pinned fixed case, which is probably the weirdest case, um, pinned fix in fix example. Um, again, we have v at 0, v at L is equal to 0, v prime at 0 is equal to 0, v double prime at L uh, is equal to 0, or m over e i at L, so our m is equal to zero. If we divide it by E L, it's still zero. Um, you can plug these in and say here V at zero ends up being C2 plus C4. V at L is zero is C1 sine of DL plus C2 cosine uh, DL doo -doo -doo. Uh, plus C3, L plus C4. You do that for the few other boundary conditions. Um, I'm not going to go through it all. I, I have some of it posted uh, again in the notes that I'll be showing online. Um, but you end up with kind of this big matrix solution that you can put, put things into. So you can actually go term by term and try to solve these out. But what we end up with um, is something like this, 0, 1, 0, 1, uh, <coughs> sine of dl, cosine of dl, l1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and d squared, sine of dl, d squared, cosine of dl, 0, 0, um, all of this times C1, C2, C3, C4 is equal to now zeros. So that system of equations you can rewrite into this sort of a form where now this is basically pulling here like C2 plus C4, C2 plus C4 is equal to zero. Um, so you can take all of these equations and rewrite them. There's now a trivial solution again, remember where, where our constants, where our C1, 2, 3, 4 is 0, there's actually an interesting solution where here now this matrix A, C, 0 matrix, um, there's an interesting solution when the determinant of A is equal to 0. If you take a determinant, how, how many of you remember determinants from linear algebra? Okay, a little bit. If you go through the math and you take a determinant of this big ugly matrix and you do a whole bunch of algebra and manipulation, you end up with something um, that is square d l is equal to tangent of d l, um, where d again is square root of p over e i. And the general, so now this is x equals tangent of x, which is 
a weird equation to solve with not exactly a, a, a pure an easy numerical answer um, but it ends up then you can if you find a number solution to that you take the lowest order number solution to that uh, resolve for p and you end up with something like a p critical is 20.19 e i over l squared which is kind of a weird number so we want to rewrite this now i'll pull a pi squared out because i liked that pi squared there from the first analysis pi squared e i uh, over l squared uh, and then i think this is like uh i didn't actually write it down there's a there's four uh, if you pull pi squared out of 20 you end up with like four point something um, i can pull this four squared onto the bottom and i pull a k in there k now is equal to that 20.19 something uh, divided by pi squared square root which or flip that one over pi squared over 20.19 some stuff which ends up being 0 0.699 which is where that number comes from. So that, that k effective length actually comes from the solution to x equals tan x, which comes from finding the determinant of the solution to our ODE, which is kind of a weird, complicated way of doing it. Technically, using this method, you can solve any boundary condition for any buckling problem uh, with any arbitrary load, but uh, it's not necessarily easy. So most of the time, most of our solutions we go back to uh, just thinking about it in terms of this and saying there's some effective length k uh, that, and then this one p critical equation for buckling. So, uh, do you mind if I take like five minutes and do a conceptual thing? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thanks. Okay, so I want to roll back really quick before Sirwin does his Sirwin goes through recitic and go through a conceptual question. So let's do some pull everywhere stuff. <coughs> and I guess these were also generally helpful. It sounded like okay. I'm glad to hear it. Okay, so this will now be going a little bit simpler. <clears throat> we're not going to be thinking about derivations. We're, we're just kind of thinking about what kinds of things buckle. So I have three beams with three different cross sections. One is a solid cross section, one is a hollow circular cross section, and then one is a long, skinny rectangle. All of them have the same area, but um, so basically the if I took all the material from that circle and pushed it out, I made a hollow circle, uh, and this one, kind of think of like the ruler for our third case. Um, the question I have is which of these beams would have the highest critical buckling load, and which one would have the lowest, and why? I can, I can roll back to, to show the cross sections again. Should I hit those results yeah. until? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> I'll give you a couple minutes. It seemed like there was a general consensus that what two two was the highest and three was the lowest. I'll have you discuss with your neighbor for about a minute as to why that might be the case.
Cool. Are you just going to go through? Yeah, stuff? I'm just going to do an uh, example. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, sorry, I didn't all of that. Okay. 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 Okay, let's come back together. So, are there any thoughts about why two might be the highest and why three might be the lowest? Other than gut feeling. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, so it's the lowest along the, I guess, this way? Yeah, yeah. across the vertical axis, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's good. Any other thoughts? Yeah? So if you have, like, you know, your typical x, y coordinate system, and you're finding the i value for a circle, your, all of your areas equally contributing to the I value around both axes for a rectangle, more of the area not needs to be one than the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're doing this, you have to consider your smallest moment of inertia. <coughs> and so looking at three, it has a very small moment of inertia compared to one. Yeah. Yeah. So. The other, the intuitive piece of it is like, think of three as trying to push on a piece of sheet metal. Yeah. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yes, so the only thing that's changing here is your area moment of inertia. Um, it turns out the further out you push a material from the center, the higher the moment of inertia is. And yes, for the rectangle, it has a higher moment of inertia in that long, skinny direction, but it's much lower in the opposite direction, so like pushing a sheet metal. Um, there's actually, you run into another problem, so this this is actually one of the better configurations for, for high moment of inertia and, and equal uh, about the axis. But if you make it too thinny, too, too thinny, too skinny, too thin, um, you end up with something known as shell buckling instabilities that'll start to happen. So think of a soda can and pushing a soda can, it'll crush and crumple. So that's what happens when you have a very skinny sheet. Aluminum cans work because they're actually loaded under pressure. So even when you stack them on top of each other, they don't take a lot of compressive load. But if they weren't loaded under pressure, they wouldn't be able to handle that sort of compression load, and they would just shell buckle, even though they have a high area moments of inertia. OK, cool. So All right. I'll let you take it away. Yeah. cross-sectional area and reduce it down to a solid bar, it still would be not a lot. Pathetically easy to squish. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. Um, I got 20 minutes. I can make it. Yeah. Cool. Should be pretty. Sure.